all the way from um, I'm all the way from the United States. Uh, two days ago, I just landed and um, had a good time. Yesterday, there was a parade uh, outside of my um, hotel, and I learned that it is uh, Saint Cyril um, Day, and I think Methodius Saint Myth Cyril and Methodius Day. That's the day of uh, Cyrillic language. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. I saw lots of parades. Um, I kind of engaged, and I went to the park. I walked around, and uh, I had a good time. I had a good time. Um, no, no side effects of uh, what do you call that? Jet lag. Uh, everything is uh, just rolling cool. You know, uh, my ver I'm at the latest version of my own release. I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm on the tip, and uh, I'm also um, here to talk about TDD in Kotlin and uh, Spring Boot. Um, Particularly Spring Boot 2.7.0 or 2.6.0 because uh, 3.0 isn't supported quite yet out of the gate using start.spring.io. But um, we'll get there. We'll get there. And let me connect to an internet connection. Uh, this should take two seconds. I have the credentials for my cell phone, which work really well. Uh, allow me to do that. I have slides. This is a mixed slide, mixed uh, live coding. Hi. I am unable to find it. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I need, well, that's a good one. I, OK, will this connect me to the internet? OK, OK, so we have that. Um, I'm not connected to the internet, you know that. Um, that's good to know. Uh, first thing about testing is, um, OK, so, so who writes code here for a purpose, on purpose? Who writes like Java, Kotlin? Um, it doesn't matter if it's Java or Kotlin, um, I, although uh, uh, Kotlin is just a dialect on the JVM. Uh, it works just as well, actually. It's easier to read for some people, um, like me. Um, I've coded in JavaScript, Scala, and other you know, non-object-oriented um, languages. Um, and I find Kotlin, the uh, ease of, of entry, uh, really appealing to me, since um, I might be talking to somebody who's not a uh, Java or a Smalltalk developer or a Rust developer or a Go developer. Kotlin is its own thing. It looks like JavaScript. It, it types like uh, Java. And, um, and it actually, it's a functional language, too. So yes. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes, I have one. Yep, I have that hooked up. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. OK, guys. You should be using some white background. Yep. Ah, OK, so I will use light mode for my uh, presentation. All right, so, oh, wow. Thank you. It's the deluge. I now have uh, enough water. Thank you so much. Allow me to switch accounts and uh, get this show going. Um, Internet connection on my phone is 5G. They say it's 5G, but uh, sometimes you got to wonder, is it 5G or is it 4G LTE or 3G wrapped in 5G? A lot of times you get wrapped um, service connections, and they're, you, know, you still get one megabit down. Um, you want 100 megabits down like you were promised. Yes. Oh, yeah, give me a second. I want to prepare the uh, screen. Yes. Yeah, I'll be right there with you guys. Uh, so. Just so you know, I have slides, and there's graphics. Um, they're not all that important. I guess the, I guess the code uh, makes more sense, uh, but it helps to uh, visualize what uh, we're going to talk about here. So what we'll do is we'll take a slide out of my old, the old page of slides, and uh, there we are. There we are. OK. That's how this works. So you get internet connection, and then your computer is happy. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, when I play video games and it asks me, hey, where's your internet connection? I get bugged out. I don't want to use an internet connection. Uh, I just want to be offline. We don't always get that satisfaction. <laughs> Here we are. OK, so what's the name of this talk? It's called Bootiful Reactive, uh, Spring, uh, Bootiful Reactive Testing. And um, there's about 10 to 12 megabytes of loading. And uh, that, that's something that uh, I, I get to deal with. I love that screen. It says loading on it. And uh, do you see how spectacular the loading screen is? Somebody tested that code. Somebody wrote that screen first, or they might. OK, let me ask you the question here. 
the, the um, prime concept of, um, of test-driven development, TDD, is don't write production first, right? So you end up writing your tests first. Um, and some people don't like this. This is kind of a hard thing to engage with, uh, with the culture of your company or your group, the people that you're um, working with. Uh, and it basically says, hey, um, I don't want to see production first. I, I want tests, and then I want you to break those tests, and then I want you to write production to fix those tests, right? So you actually have a loop, and that loop looks something like write some test first, break it, fix it in production, recurse, right? Um, and that's, that's our thing. That's what we're going to do here. Um, don't worry about the, um, the, some of the you know, things in here. What we have is a little biography about this guy that's in front of you. That's me, Mario. Um, I work at VMware. I'm with the Spring team. I work with um, you know, uh, Starbucks man, Josh Lung. He's been here a few times. Uh, way, way, way back when. I think I was at uh, Java Fest or Java 4 Days, maybe back in 2010. Uh, that was fun. Um, I'm glad to be back here and uh, enjoy uh, Sophia and uh, be with some friends. And uh, check out my GitHub if you have a chance. It's the demos, but really there's demo chat, and uh, I'll probably give you a shameless plug about demo chat uh, later on. Uh, but this is Bootiful Reactive testing with consumer-driven contracts. Whew, that's a lot, right? That's a whole lot of, uh, of um, introduction there with Spring Boot. OK. And so let's talk about this. What is this? What is Kotlin? Right? Uh, what do we talk about? It's JVM-based language with functional uh, syntax, meaning that I can uh, write lambdas out of the gate without, any, uh, without thinking about it much. Think about back in the days of like Java 8. right? L writing lambdas was kind of hard. It, w it looked kind of weird. It was like, oh, you know you're doing something, but you know you're still a far away from being a Scala or even being a TypeScript or Heck, uh, JS like seven. Uh, who knows? Um, but these days, uh, the JVM has come a long way. Even Java itself has come a long way. So it's a little bit more functional now. Kotlin brought that first a few years ago, uh, and so we're reaping the benefits of of a, of a JVM language. Um, Test-driven development helps us make better code decisions. Um, like I said earlier, it's about culture. Uh, it's about who do you engage in in your company or your group, the people you're developing with. If you're an open source project or if you're a closed source project. Uh, it helps to engage in the type of decisions that you know about your code, uh, because you want to people to have confidence in the code first, uh, and you want them to be able to read the code first. Uh, and so TDD allows us to be able to kind of grep what the code does uh, before we have specs, right? We, we might have specs, but you don't want to read a Word document. Um, it's easier to read code sometimes and know what the code actually does. All right. Uh, test slices. So this is a Spring thing. Test slices are actually a way of abstracting uh, individual parts of the Spring web container uh, and the persistence uh, aspects of Spring. So essentially, we can take all of the Spring context, ignore most of it. We can say, OK, I don't need, uh, if I'm doing a web test, I don't need persistence. Uh, I'm going to test that separately. And then Spring, Spring Cloud Contract. Uh, that's the thing that allows us to test our service contracts. Basically, if I have a web endpoint, like a, like a Hello World endpoint, uh, I can write a contract that describes it and says, this is what Hello World should look like, and then that contract gets tested. All right, so um, now that we know like, a basic overview of what things are, the big thing, the, big, the reason why I, I love talking about this, reactive. Who here is developing anything in reactive uh, streams. Oh, wow. OK, that's a few more people than last time. It used to be just one hand went up, or one hand shook and said, oh my god, am I the only one? Um, so now there's a few more people doing reactive streams. Uh, and, in, and in fact, you probably know that Kotlin does reactive streams kind of natively. It doesn't need you to interact with the API anymore. You can just kind of write it implicitly. Uh, and that's great stuff. Um, I'm still talk my talk is still talking about the reactive spec and how the, uh, basically the reactive uh, API works in a very, very general overview. So we're not going to go too far into the weeds here. So basically, reactive is uh, a publisher. Uh, and a publisher can emit zero or many or zero or one. Uh, a mono is just a publisher that emits one. Uh, a flux is a publisher that can emit zero or an infinite amount of objects or you know, characters or whatever you're, you're transmitting over the wire. Um, reactive gives us black back pressure. So when um, the only way reactive works 
is when everybody is reactive. It doesn't work halfway. You can't have non-reactive talk to reactive, uh, unless it's like through HTTP, protocol adapters, things like that. Um, and then you still want reactive, but the idea is that your clients are also reactive clients. This means that your clients are able to say, I want X or I want N many objects, I want N many um, items from a result. Uh, and that way, your server goes, oh, you, you can only handle five because of memory constraints, for instance, uh, and so, or network pressure, and it'll give you just as many as you've asked until it's exhausted, right? So the idea is that's baked into the wire protocol, uh, which is important, um, especially when you're dealing with long haul or you know, lossy connections and things like that. TDD is the other half, which is essentially, hey, we're going to fail first, we're going to fix it in production, that means we're going to write our tests, then we're going we're to break them, then we're going to write the code in production, which is our regular class, and then we're going to not go overboard in production. We're only going to write enough production, just a little bit of production, not a whole lot of production. Um, basically, write l as little code as possible. Uh, and I kind of like that. I kind of like the idea of, um, or I used to come from a habit of writing all of my production first and then testing it and then realizing that all of those lines of code weren't actually being tested. And then I'd have to write extra classes in order to test those little bits of production that I wrote. Um, and I realized, yeah, that's, you know, I, I'm pretty sure nobody does that anymore. But remember, I've been coding for maybe 30 years. So I have some bad habits. Um, and, and largely, if you look at the security outside of what you are doing, most of the code out there is written by people like me who have really bad habits. And, and you have lots of bugs and lots of security exploits. And uh, TDD helps us alleviate those type of things. Um, it doesn't completely eliminate them, but it helps. This is Bob Martin, the co-signer of the uh, Reactive Manifesto. And it says, uh, you know, the TDD TNETs, the thing that I said earlier, I'll just reiterate what he says. Uh, it's basically, one, you can't write any production code unless it is to make a failing unit test pass. Uh, two, you're not allowed to write any more of a unit test than sufficient to fail. And compilation failures are test failures. So when I see red on my IDE, um, that's also a compilation failure. Um, I'm not allowed to write, and three is, I'm not allowed to write any more production code uh, that is sufficient to pass that one failing test, which means don't go overboard in production. Remember, I used to write so much production code. No, I don't. Now I write barely anything, barely any production code, only the stuff that I need to write. So whatever my spec is, I'm going to just do that. And it's demo time. So for the demo, we're going to start in one place. And I'm pretty sure that you know where that is. Start dot spring dot. I'm not sure if I got that right. Let me see if that's correct. Is it, is it start dot spring dot IO or is it start dot spring dot net? I don't know. Um, you know what? We're going to find out. Let's see. Yeah, see, that doesn't work. Oh, I don't even know where that goes. Yeah, that, that doesn't go anywhere, so good. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a Maven project. We're going to use Kotlin. Uh, we'll use 2.7.0 for Spring Boot. Uh, I'm going to give this a uh, group name of com example. I'm going to call the artifact um, uh, Sophia t uh, TDD. That's too many words. That's too many letters. That's, that's not good enough. I'll just call it uh, demo. Sophia. OK, that looks good. OK, so, so this is actually the J prime uh, TDD demo. And um, I don't like that package name. We're going we're gonna to have to call it J prime. Let's just call it J prime. You know, you ever like sit there and you wonder about the package names you want to make, and you kind of go through all the names, like, I'm not sure what to name it. I'm just not sure how to, what, what do I call this? Um, you know what we should do? Because this is, we're going to write two sides of this. STD, exactly, right? <laughs> we're uh, monkey pox. That's the name of my artifact. Uh, we're going to call this uh, a producer. Uh, since what we're going to do is we're going to write the producer side of the application first, the thing that serves data, and then we're going to write the client side. So let's go, let's add some things to this. Um, to be quick and to be succinct, I know you guys probably want to see like SQL and stuff, um, but who doesn't like Mongo? You, you know, that question is really important. Who doesn't like MongoDB? Raise your hand. OK, wow, wow, just wow. Oh, OK, 10 years ago, everybody's hand went up. Uh, today, like, yeah, what? I don't hate MongoDB. It's fine. Awesome, wow. Like, we've gone there already. You know, we've been there and back. That's amazing. I love that. 
So what we're going to do is use uh, Spring Data Reactive MongoDB. Um, we're going to use an embedded MongoDB. Uh, call it Flapdoodle. Oops. And we're going to use um, WebFlux, or Reactive Web. Hi. Just give me my. You know, there, there's, a, there's a script for this, but I, I like the demo effect. Um, and then we're going to use um, Verifier, yes. So we're going to use Contract Verifier. That's the thing that does our CDC and our, our tests uh, for the contract itself. Um, I might have to skip on uh, some of that and go into a project and show you what that all looks like without typing it out. I, I am going to be constrained a little bit here. Um, but we're going to get through the whole demonstration. Um, so we have our, our uh, things here. We have our reactive web. We have our... Um, our database, uh, we have our contract verifier, and do I need anything else? No, uh, that looks good. Yeah, I'm not doing much. I have my reactive, and I will generate this. And uh, let's see, new window. What did I call it? Producer. Yeah, so I trust the window. OK. So uh, first things first. Um, oh, we're going to get to brass tacks here. We're going to find out if my internet connection is going to be the thing that uh, I scratch my head a lot at. Uh, but it won't. OK. So let's write a test. Uh, first test is going to be producer application tests. No, I'm going to refactor that. I'm starting with the refactor out of the gate. And I, and I hope you're proud of that, because I think everybody who does refactoring are good people. I think good people refactor. Bad people, I don't know what they do, but they might also refactor too. Just saying. There, there are some good people, and there are some bad people, and they both refactor. That's how that works. We're going to call this producer data tests. Uh, and we're going to introduce the first, web, uh, the first spring test slice. Uh, and that test slice looks like this, data mongo test. And uh, let's see, there is a property I need to add in here really quickly, but I won't do that yet. I'll just leave that the way it is. Uh, we'll say auto wired, um, private late in it, var. Um, I can use lazy. I used to use lazy in that a lot, but I use late in it var a lot now. So we'll call this repository, and we'll make something called the. Um, we're going we're gonna to trade people. We're going to use names. How about that? So person repository. And I don't have one yet. I have a compilation fa failure right now. Oh, God. Um, so no, nobody wants a compilation failure, right? Uh, let's get rid of those right now. Uh, let's call it interface person repository. And let's say this person repository uh, is a reactive. Mongo repository. Now, the reason why I'm using this specifically is because it's so simple to set up, uh, especially for testing it in a demo environment. Uh, however, if I already use JDBC, I do a, lot, a little bit more configuration. Uh, in this, I'm kind of given the time of not having to configure it as much, uh, since I don't have the template uh, already set up for the uh, RD, R2DBC um, uh, module. So we're going to use person, which I don't have yet, and then we're going to use UUID as our um, yeah, you could use string. Uh, it's Mongo. Mongo doesn't care about like, what your ID is as long as, as it's an ID. Um, so what we're going to need to do is fix this compilation error. Um, and so since we have a repository, we um, are using, is anybody here using uh, Spring Data uh, or reactive Spring Data? One second. After uh, we finish, uh, we'll do that. Um, what we want to do is create a, a person um, and just go ahead and say, here is a class. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, you guys. Oh, you, this is so, like, oh, that's embarrassing. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, what do I normally do here? Oh, wow. I haven't, I've, I've used code for way too long. OK, let's, uh, let's go ahead and say uh, uh, visual, we'll just. The parents will say uh, light. Uh, that way you guys can see better. And then uh, we'll say font. Let's go with um, a higher size. Uh, 
Let's see, everything here is large, so let's, that looks good. Okay, okay, so we have, I think that might work, no? Okay, but it looks too small still. Let's go to 21, 24, let's go to 24. How's that? Is that any better? Can anybody, is that barely better? Hardly? No, it's still too big, too high resolution. Um, how about this? Let's go for this. Let's, uh, let's, this is easy. We can solve this. Uh, let's go ahead and say, I want to optimize for this. I'll scale it to, oh, it's 1080p. Uh, 1080p should be good enough. Uh, I need 1080p. Um, it doesn't look like 1080p to me. It looks like um, 5K to me, but uh, that's because I'm on my retina monitor. Uh, let's do size uh, 26. Okay. All right, that's a little bigger. Oh, hi. Okay. So there's you. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So did that change one here? No, it hasn't. I will be doing this until the end of time, won't I? Uh, let's go ahead and make that 28. Hi, thank you. And say, did I not? Uh, okay, let me drive the whole uh, editor and uh, go to my font and say 28, apply. Okay, it's a little bigger. Okay, I think that's big enough. Yeah, but looks, I, c I can barely read that. Can anybody read that? Is that legible? Okay. Okay, so we have a person repository. Let's continue. Uh, let's add our person. Uh, I think I was in the middle of creating person, perhaps a uh, destination package. Yeah, okay, there it is. So, data class person, um, what was I going to do? I was going to create an ID, um, val ID as a string and val uh, name as a string. Uh, so we'll do both things here. It's a string string. Uh, that looks good. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to do here is I want to test that um, we want to essentially see, hey, uh, will this thing save? Will it return? And that's it. But what we're going to do, we're going to do it the reactive way. Um, so if you haven't seen reactive so far, we're going to introduce a component that's pretty cool. Let's, let's create one stream, let's call a save stream. And what this is going to do is say, hey, repo.save. And we're going to create a person. We're going to give it an ID, one, two, three, four. And we'll call the name, uh, mm -hmm. what's a good name? Mm, Constantine. OK, so that's the name, Constantine. OK, um, we'll save stream, and then we'll say val uh, find stream. And we'll create another stream. Now, oops find all. Because we only expect one, we'll just say find all. It should just return a flux of items. Um, now, what's happening here is this is a publisher. And this is a, a reactive streams publisher of person. So we expect a, a thing, a stream, to uh, receive a, a single person element from the save command. Uh, and this, likewise, is a publisher of uh, person as well. However, this is going to be a different publisher. This is going to be a flux um, infinite publisher, right? Because we're going to find all, and that can be like zero or infinity, right? So what we'll do here is we'll say combined, val combine or composed. We'll take the streams, and we'll compose them. And we'll say, uh, OK. So you have this thing called a flux, and you can talk to it, the API. You can say, hey, flux uh, dot from. And you can say, hey, I have a stream that I want to begin. And I will give it the stream that I want to begin. So let's begin with the from save stream. And then many, um, it, it's another operator that says, OK, once you complete save stream, once it's saved, and once it's returned and it's OK and hasn't errored out, um, we're going to then do this stream here. 
and return whatever comes out of that stream. So then we'll, we have a combined stream that now returns the result of find mini. Um, it both does save and then it does find. Um, it doesn't do them in tandem. You can, you, know, uh, you can try that, you can do that, but for now we're going to let it happen uh, serially. So one happens and then the other happens. And then we want to test it. So like, how do you test a stream that happens on another thread? Um, those are things that are uh, usually hard to come by. What type of API does this? Uh, so in this case, we have something called the step verifier. And let's go into the step verifier uh, code real quick, because I don't have the sources. Why would I have the sources on me anymore? I mean, honestly. So we can say uh, create, oops, yeah, there we are. So this is the step verifier. It provides a declarative way of creating a verifiable script for asynchronous publishers. Um, it expresses the expectation about what's going to happen in the stream. So I'm going to expect a person, and I'm going to assert the state of that person, right? So we can say create um, composed. And then we can say, now what, now what we're going to do is assert the state of that stream. So we expect something to happen. And we can say assert next. Assert next allows us to write a lambda. And that lambda takes um, a, fun it's a function. And so we take the function goes, uh, actually, it's a consumer, sorry. Um, it takes a person. And what we'll do is we'll say, uh, we'll use, um, Assertions, assert A. I know somebody, somebody is sitting here going, I don't like assert A, Mario. What are you doing? But I'm using assert A because it's very easy to write uh, individual uh, assertion logic that's simple and uh, fast. And uh, we care about speed sometimes. Oh, I actually care about speed sometimes. Uh, yeah, assert that person is not null and uh, has, uh, no nulls, has no null fields or properties. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff like uh, has field or property with value. And I can say, hey, what is the name? And it can be, you know, uh, what is the name of our, of our guy here? That's Constantine. And, uh, and then that's it, right? OK, so assertion will we'll check to make sure that the state's the thing that I expect. Uh, we have expectations. And now we have the last part of our um, reactive uh, test. So what happens in the, um, at the end is, so we have this thing called verify complete, right? Um, so verify complete basically says, OK, um, remember, this is, not, this is not executed until none of this is executed uh, at, at compile or runtime, OK? This isn't executed until a verify complete uh, actually um, pulls the cord on the stream and does all of the work. For, um, for the composed stream here. So uh, verify completes the thing that actually subscribes to our publisher. So you need a subscriber, and the idea is a subscriber should be able to take the results out and then do something with them. And that's what verify complete does. It takes the results and it does something with them, which is it executes this here uh, composition of assertion logic. Okay? So if you run that, it should pass. Um, I didn't break that test, but if I did, um, it's probably because I'm missing a a uh, little thing here. And I, and I concede, I can see, I can see that they're test property sources, something that you're missing. Um, so when you're using the embedded MongoDB database, you have to give it a, a property source, and that property basically has to be spring MongoDB embedded version, and you just tell it which version of MongoDB you use. In the past, in a previous version, um, that was automatic. It would, it would just find any version, and then it would download it and execute it. And that wasn't, uh, people didn't like that behavior. Uh, people don't like the idea that it's downloading some version that we don't know, we haven't tested, right? So this gives us a chance to tell it exactly which version do we want and how are we going to test it, OK? So we're going to run that test really quickly, and then we're going to move on to the next uh, test, which is our WebMVC test. So so assuming that that works, and it should, hi, uh, we're going to call this um, producer uh, rest tests. Ooh, I know what you're thinking. Like, why would you write rest tests that way, Mario? Why would you, in why would you uppercase an entire word? I did. So what is this here, WebMVC MVC test? Remember that thing I, s I talked about, test slices? This is another test slice. 
And, and this particular test slice, oh, I have code for it. Look at that. Um, this particular test slice um, is used for Spring MVC tests that focus only on Spring MVC components. And we don't want that. We want um, Web Flux tests, because that's what we're testing today. We're testing Web Flux. Uh, if we were doing the imperative version, that is the non-reactive version, we would say Web MVC tests. Today, we're going to use uh, Web Flux tests, and that gives us the uh, reactive uh, web stack, right? So this one is used only for Spring Web Flux tests that focus only on Web Flux components, which is what we're going to build in a second. Okay. So first things first. Remember the thing about testing and how we like to not test everything all at once at first? Like, we just want to test a little bit at a time. Um, in this case, we're going to only test the web stack, which means we're not going to have Mongo databases backing our web tests, right? Uh, so in order to do that correctly, we have to call it a mock bean, and we have to say, hey, I have a component, and it's a repository. And this person repository uh, is a component that is mocked, right? And I'll, I'll say um, before each, and I'll say function setup, and um, I'll use BDD Makito. Um, I know that might not be your preferred Makito flavor. Um, I get it. But we'll give it some behavior. We have to give it a stub behavior. Constantine is just such an easy word to write, and there are no frameworks called Constantine. Why? That is a great name. It's a, it's a great movie, too, by Keanu Reeves. I don't even know why they don't do that. Anyway, um, don't worry about me. Uh, I'll be fine. OK, so what we did here is we just set up the um, mock repository, because we're going to have to test that in a second. And we're going to say here, test and um, function should get all from end. Oh, well, we don't need to worry about it. We could just say should get all. Uh, slash all. OK, so what this is going to do is, um, uh, let's see, web test client. So we have something called web test client, OK? A web test client is this thing. It's a, it's a component. Remember step verifier that we had earlier? We had step verifier for streams. Well, we have web test client for reactive uh, HTTP endpoints. So essentially, we're given a a client that talks reactive on the wire to our code, right? So it talks HTTP uh, outside, and it gives us reactive results. And what I want to do here is uh, I, can, I could bind this to anything I want. Um, I could bind it to the server. I could bind it to an application context. Um, that is the current application context. I can bind it to an at controller. Uh, or I could bind it to a router function. I'm going to bind it to a router function today. Um, and I'll show you what that means here. So router, uh, we'll call this one um, hmm, uh, person router uh, repo, because we're going to create a person repository. Um, we're going to create a person router. So we have an error here. I have to stop coding my test, because it failed already. Uh, so what we're going to do is, hi, I don't want to function. My bad. Um, I was a little overzealous. Excuse me. Uh, person router, person router. Remember, do we have that? D is it here? No? Is it not there? OK, whatever. Uh, we'll just say, hey, Kotlin class, give me person router. Um, and uh, that should work. So, um, so this thing here, uh, let's see. It could be a component. Uh, that might be right. Um, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll say bean. Uh, and the next thing we'll do is we'll say function uh, person route. And it was going to return a server response. Uh, OK, so what we're going to do is we're creating this router that returns a router function. Remember, it's a, it's a HTTP function that exists as a, as a, um, as a way to um, service an endpoint, right? Now, what we want to do is uh, we want to say get all. We're going to use the Kotlin DSL, because remember, we're using the router 
uh, which essentially returns our Java types, but it gives us a Kotlinified uh, sugared syntax uh, DSL for writing our uh, individual routes for our REST components. Right? So normally, you're used to like, writing controllers or at REST controller. Uh, in this one, I'm doing it programmatically. Um, OK. Let's see if I remember how to write that already. Have I even, have I even remembered that uh, particular version? Uh, server response. Oh, yeah, there you are. Oh, look at that. We're missing something. OK. All right, so I don't need to uh, outline this as a component, but I will. It can be a configuration, rather. Oops. Or a component, um, either way. Um, so what I basically stated here is the server response is going to say, hey, it's A OK. A two, um, it's going to give us a 200 result. Uh, the body will return a repository find all call. And remember, this is functional, so it's also Java. So we have to tell it, oh, this is the type of, um, this is the type of data that we're going to expect um, from our repository. Uh, so essentially, we just expect it to return something in the shape of a person, uh, the one that I wrote. Hopefully, that's this guy here. And that's all there is to it. OK, so up until now, excuse me, can I, I'm hearing so far. Uh, up until now, I've, I've said uh, bind to that function that I've just written, uh, and then build the instance of web test client, and then execute a git against slash all except application JSON. Exchange does the you know, server side uh, exchange, uh, and then to expect a body. Or actually, we're going to expect status, and we want it to be OK. And we want to say expect body. And uh, let's see. Headers. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Ooh, my bad. Expect headers. And we want the header type to be a uh, content type of uh, media type dot JSON. So we want it to ensure that, hey, you're returning a JSON payload. OK, grid. Um, now we can say expect body. And then we could do something pretty cool. We can say, hey, JSON path. Um, and what this allows us to do is inspect JSON. And then that's it. So there's nothing else to that. Uh, essentially, the, the router function, let's, let's just execute that. Let's make sure we didn't break it. And if we did, we have a place to find our, our unbroken tests because we tested this beforehand which is very important. We must test everything. And that failed, of course. What did that fail? What happened here? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, I know why. I know why. That'll, that'll be one second here. Yes, of course. Yeah. So you, get over here. I need you. OK. OK, there you go. There you go. That's better. OK, so what we did was, OK, we have to give the verb. You need a verb and a, and a URI, uh, and the URI will, yeah. You, you kind of, this is kind of easy to read, I think. I like the readability of these. So, hey, um, if you find the readability a little bit off, then uh, we'll talk. You know, we can talk about that.
Okay, moving on. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, we have the ability to say, hey, I have, um, you know, I have the slash all endpoint, um, and I want people to be able, I want like a, another client team or somebody else to basically write a client. Um, so how do I do that? And, and how do I make it so that that client is also um, something that I can test against? How do, I, how do I test a server without starting the server? Like a lot of times we have development environments, and, you know, we spring up the whole server, and, you know, in the past, that was hard. Nowadays, we have Docker Compose, and we have Kubernetes, and we have all of our orchestration. Um, and so it's not so hard, but still, you're out there, and you're thinking, hey, I don't want to have to engage with the platform. I just want to test. And, and this is a way to do just a test of the service, all right, from the client's perspective. But first, we need to write the test from the service's perspective. So what we're going to do here is a little bit of magic that I like to call um, cloud contract verifier. So if you notice, we have this guy here. It's going to let us do really cool stuff. Um, let me scroll. Let me keep scrolling. I know there's a configuration attribute here somewhere. And here it is. There it is. So, so this little guy here, this, this build plugin, right? So this is the thing that gets you know, injected when you start .spring.io. Mm. Ooh, OK. I'll I'll, I'll be less aggressive on my voice. Um, and what it basically tells us is, OK, so you're going to have a contract. Uh, you're going to create a, a text file that describes your endpoint. OK, I'm going to do that. Um, and then you're going to have a test framework that executes the test for the contract. I know, chicken and egg. It's chicken. Wh what came first, chicken or egg? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure if a contract came first and the contract was in the egg, but the, there was no chicken to read the contract. So what, who does EULA, you know, end user license agreement for an egg? Nobody. Um, I'll be here all day with these jokes, guys. Have the salmon. OK, so let's, uh, let me just insert some code, uh, a little bit of code here um, that will kind of make this go by a little faster. Uh, since typing it does take a little longer, and I am running out of uh, the essence of, of existence here called time. OK, so what we want to do is we have com example, and then we have my own package name producer, and we're going to call that producer. We're going to create a class called contract verifier base, OK? Um, and what that's going to do is I'll show you. And let's go here. Let's say, hey, contract verifier base. And uh, the following thing will happen. Um, you will say at setup, hi. Oh, before each, duh. Fun setup. Ha ha ha. I get that. I do that all the time. OK. Um, the next thing I want to do here is I want to, I'm going to copy and paste something that I already have. Because, hey, you guys, I have a few minutes, and uh, I don't want this to be something that you guys don't get. Uh, I want you guys to get everything. So person repository. Um, and then uh, I believe that this is going to be an abstract class because it will be overridden. So we have abstract class uh, contract verifier. Um, let's not look at this yet. OK, so we have a mock bean, right? Remember, we have to mock out our repository. We're not going to have live resources. Um, and then once we mock out our repository, we don't have a UUID. Um, there are no UUIDs here. Who, who are you with your UUIDs? I have no idea. OK, these people and their UUIDs. OK. so. Um, what we did here is we said, OK, we're going to first configure the repository, right? Because we're going to talk to a web endpoint that we configured, that we created, um, that is our router. Uh, second thing is we're going to configure rest assured. Uh, rest assured is going to be the thing that creates the uh, uh, HTTP endpoint for verifying that contract that we're about to write. We're about to write a contract that will get turned into an actual web endpoint and then tested. I know, you're, you're, you're thinking, what the heck are you talking about? OK, bear with me here. This is, this is really simple. This is, this is not magic. It's not really hard to deduce. Um, deduce. So if you notice here, um, first of all, rest assured web test client config, 
uh, contains, you know, I give you my encoder, I tell you, hey, this is the stuff I expect to encode with, um, that's fine. Um, and then I have standalone setup, which means I'm going to have a standalone setup with a specific router, and I'm, I'm going to execute that, right? That's all I'm going to do. I want that rest assured web test client to just understand that one router, um, this person router here. So it, it only responds to this guy. Now, my contract is going to, uh, it's going to, this is going to make sure that, see this live data that I put in here for the, for the repository? My contract has to look like this. So whatever I have in my contract look, needs to look like what I have in my test code here. This is my base test for testing that contract. And so my contract will look very similar. So first things first, uh, let's create a piece of JSON, and let's call it person.json, right? And uh, we're going to say, uh, yeah, you have an ID, and uh, your ID is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you have a name, and you have, your name is uh, Constan Con Constantine, OK? And uh, so you have, a, you have a piece of JSON, uh, and that's what it looks like. Then you have your actual contract, and we're going to call this contract um, uh, should find all. And uh, yes, oh, my bad. That, that is not a file. Yeah, that is, that is not a file. Uh, a file should be should find all dot yaml. I I hear I I, I understand I, I now understand what just happened. I, I see the light, you guys. I, I, I understand what's going on here. Um, you guys don't hate Mongo anymore. Nobody hates Mongo anymore. People used to rail about Mongo being this and that and the other thing. I now know what happened. You guys don't like YAML. So all that vitriol went to YAML. Like, it was, it was Mongo, and now it's YAML. Like, it moves, right? It used to be Windows. People used to hate Windows. Now people love Windows. It's like the greatest thing out, out there now. Now YAML's the enemy. I, I think the next thing that's the enemy is, um, I'm going to say it later. I don't want to get pelted by tomatoes. OK, so this is what our contract looks like. Basically, it, a contract consists of a description, a name. That's basically something that describes what we're doing. Um, so that when it fails, it tells you exactly what failed, um, and then a request. So what we're doing here is we're telling the contract um, or the developer on the other end, hey, uh, our, our web endpoint is a URL slash all, and it's a verb called get. And it will return a status of 200, and it has these headers, and it has this body. Uh, and remember that body that I just wrote here, it will look like this. So um, what's going to end up happening is this contract gets turned into an artifact, and that artifact will get downloaded by a client, and the client will then be able to test uh, their, cli their client ability off of this contract alone. Now, what does that look like in practice? Good question. Uh, with five minutes left, I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm not going to show you there, uh, because that is not what live code is all about, is it? Yes, trust. Hi. No, I, oh, I see what you're doing. If you, if you touch the window, it slides over to the context of the application. Aha. OK, so what we're going to do here is, um, oh, please tell me you just wrote, you didn't just. I mean, seriously, right? Like, uh, you expect these things to just work. OK, um, so, so essentially it's this. Um, remember. Remember a minute ago, I had a person, um, and that person was, was abstracted by a, a, um, a, you know, a bean, or not a bean, but a, a pojo, and the pojo just had an ID and a name. Um, um, we're going to switch just a little bit for one minute, and we're going to say uh, it is going to be a, a, uh, a customer instead. Um, this is a client. This is the client side of that. Now, in order to get it to work, we need to say auto configure stub runner. I know this looks hard. This isn't that, like, you know, let's, let's assume that I ran this test and it worked. And it, and it should, it, it, but it won't, uh, because I am missing one vital piece. Um, but on the endpoint of my verifier, I will have an artifact. That artifact now looks like this. And I have a client, so I, I wrote a client 
and that client is able to say, okay, I'm going to locate um, an artifact that says something like com example. Uh, we can just change that around, and we can say um, the J prime, and uh, all. Um, plus 8090, okay. So, so the way this works is I'm giving it a coordinate um, to test the client. The client looks like something that's out of com.example. It has an artifact name, which in this case is all imperative, and it has a version. The version is uh, listed by the plus sign, and the uh, port will be listening on port 8090, uh, so that when the uh, test is set up, it can then run the individual units. Uh, so the individual units will look something just like out of a normal uh, use case. In, in this case, uh, I have a client itself, uh, an actual thick client, or not a thick client, but like a regular class, you know, something that uses REST template. Uh, you know, it uses a regular HTTP callout, and it goes, hey, I need to contact whatever the client is, and I need to get data out of it, right? Uh, and in this case, all it does is it does exactly that. It just makes a call to my client, uh, to my contract client, right? that ensures that the thing that I expect, the behavior from the server, is exactly set up that way, right? So that's it. So, so it's, it's, it's no harder than uh, essentially lining up your resource to the actual application that you're going to test, uh, and that resource is a stub. That stub um, looks like, you know, uh, com example, uh, in this case, I have a, a class called all imperative. Let's open up the server side of this just to give you guys an indication of uh, where I was going on the server side. Okay. So yeah, that, that seems to have done, done it. Okay, all right. So I guess I just ignored my idea upon that XML. Oh, okay, that's why. All right, okay, that's how this works. Essentially, the same test over and over and over again. Um, you have a base class, you have the contract. Um, this comes out of a different class path. Uh, there's a little bit of misdirection here. Um, in, a, in any case, the contract is getting, it's getting created into an uh, artifact. That artifact is being downloaded. And, 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 um, and yeah, uh, if, if I ran this, it will take longer than the time I have. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, first of all, thank you for, man, I forgot that earlier. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, second of all, um, I shouldn't have to take a minute to compile this, but it will take a minute to compile. Let's just see. That will take probably five minutes, who knows. Okay, so just let it go. It'll, it'll do its thing. Um, any questions about uh, what you just saw? Since it's a good time to ask, ask, or ask questions, none? Zero, no questions. Not even about YAML. Why did, why did you use YAML? Why didn't you use the Kotlin uh, dialect? Nothing, not even Groovy? Really? Okay, good. Okay, because that's great. Um, we don't need to talk about those things. Uh, we could talk about those later tonight, uh, not now. Um, talk about Groovy. Who's using Groovy anyway? Wow. Okay, that's like half the, okay, like less than uh, five. Less people are using Ruby that, okay, so Groovy is popular, but more people are using Kotlin now. It was flipped a few years ago. It was mostly Groovy in Java. Now it's Kotlin in Java. OK. Well, that's exactly how that works. Um, thank you for coming to my show. Um, I have another slide. Um, don't look at that. That's, that's from years ago. Those people are gone. Um, this talk is shutting down in 60 seconds. Um, I'm blinking. My, my screen says, Mario, um, you know, you're out of tags, man. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with this. Um, go ahead, check it out. Uh, there are a few pieces of code that I've put together. You might like something about um, distributed uh, monolithic, very monolithic services, but then you, you have the ability to c take the monoliths and break them apart. Um, so that's inside of my GitHub. Somewhere you'll find it. It's called demo chat. 
Uh, it's monolithic slash microservices all at the same time. Questions? I heard none. It was all about Groovy, right? You guys wanted to know why I didn't use Groovy? Because, I don't, because nobody uses Groovy anymore. Why? I don't know. Um, thanks.